Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette, and we're so glad you're with us today to stay curious with our friend and the former voice of NASA, Mr. Hugh Harris. How you doing, sir? Good to see you. Always good to see you, and <clears throat> Hugh contributes monthly to our Stay Curious program with insights to the shuttle era and the space program in general, as he was the voice of NASA for many years on the world's television networks, devoted 35 years to NASA, telling the story of the American space program. And uh, I'm proud to call you my friend. So we got a wonderful program together with the, the shuttles of the month. Uh, Hugh, we've had, uh, did you have a good holiday? Oh, it was very nice, but very quiet. Very quiet with you and your wife, and uh, you just turned 90 years old. We had a birthday party for you there. So is Santa Claus extra special to you this year? Well, of course, the <laughs> birthday party was the biggest thing. <laughs> well, we did have a lot of fun, and you can go back that and see that on our YouTube channel. And we appreciate everybody embracing the American Space Museum podcast. Stay curious, as this is what we bring to you a-list space workers and, of course, a lot of the B-listers, too, like Marty Winkle, my friend and co-producer here. You don't mean mind being on the B-list, do you, Marty? Oh, I think he's on the A-list. Well, he is in my mind for looking out <laughs> the triangular windows of the, the, the lunar lander well, with you, Drummond. You, but you wouldn't get the on the podcast if it wasn't for him. <laughs> You've got a point there, Hugh. Marty, how are you today? I'm doing fine, Mark, and I don't mind being on a B-list as long as I'm on a list. There you go. <laughs> and he's speaking to you from the UCAC family microphone, Tom, and uh, his wife, Vicki, and his brother, Mark UCAC, bought us that microphone mm -hmm. so we could hear uh, Marty's commentary there. So, Hugh, I just wanted to mention something before we get wound up here that uh, we're always about the space worker. Oh, let me go back there. Uh, the space worker. We have a space page that I don't know if you're on or not. It's called spacehonors.org. Uh, simply put your biography as a space worker up there. We have over hmm. 4,000 space workers on there. Uh, over half of them were put in from our database in sketchy information. So you might already be on our space honors Facebook or not Facebook web website and not uh, know it. So if you're a space worker, it's free. Uh, Jim Tully is the former shuttle uh, LPS worker and former mayor Titusville who manages this oh. page. So uh, we want to bring that to everybody's awareness that what other industry in America wants to recognize their workers more than the space industry? Well, and I, I think very appropriate too. Absolutely. They've all done things like Marty Winkle that doesn't necessarily translate into society because it's all about getting off the earth and eventually populating our solar system. Well, Hugh, here is a beautiful picture of you in action. And I just wanted to mention to our friends out there that although you're best known for your calm professional commentary on the progress of launch preparations in the launch of a space shuttle, what Hugh Harris's primary accomplishment has been for NASA is directing an outreach program to the general public, news media, students, and educators, as well as business and community leaders. You were actually the third director of public affairs mm -hmm. after Gordon Harris and Chuck Hollings head. And uh, one of the accomplishments you did was the wall of chroniclers, the chroniclers being the um, uh, Hall of Fame, so to speak, for the media out there. So I know you kind of blush at some of these uh, accolades that I love people for, to, to know that you have, Hugh, but uh, you have been, you have made your impact on NASA that will be lived on uh, throughout its history. Any comment on that? <laughs> well, it, it's hard to follow that. <laughs> well, good. Well, I won't let you follow that then. Let's just get into your 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 head and your knowledge of some of these shuttles of the month of January. Uh, Ten shuttles of January. All orbiters flew uh, in the month of January, uh, and uh, uh, which is kind of unique. And we're going to take them. Here are their uh, their mission logos on there. Uh, in the order of the day of the month that they were launched is how we rack them up on our display here. But we're going to go through the missions with you year by year, starting with the first mission, 51C, 
1985. Hugh, before we get carried away with this, please explain to us a little bit this anomaly of the 51C, 51L, 61B. Where did we go to the, after the first eight shuttles, uh, they went to, um, I think it was maybe the, yeah, STS-8. I think STS-9 was the first one to go to this. Why was that, you think? Well, it's very hard to uh, explain bureaucratic type of decisions. <laughs> I I personally had to do uh, with superstition and uh, that somebody did not want to have an STS-13. Mm -hmm. uh, we had an Apollo 13, and that didn't turn out as well as it might have. <laughs> but, exactly. <laughs> but, and, and the launch of, of STS-107, Columbia's fated launch, was the 113th launch of the program. Well, I, I personally think that the, the number you put on something has nothing to do with their value. Uh, and uh, so, uh, however, uh, it, it partly was a bookkeeping uh, thing uh, because there's about a million parts in a uh, space shuttle. And I, I can't remember how many companies are involved, but it's hundreds and um, sometimes thousands actually of uh, different entities that are doing things and keeping track of all that uh, is a major problem uh, especially since in uh, the early days computers uh, were not that uh, uh, well capable uh, in uh, in doing some of the uh, uh, the mundane bookkeeping work of that mm -hmm. Well, 51C, for example, was launched in the fiscal year 1985, which goes from October to October, not January to January, further confusing things. Uh, and uh, the one meant uh, Kennedy mm -hmm. Space Center, two was going to be Vandenberg, because they were going to launch, uh, Discovery was going to be bought by the Air Force and launched from Vandenberg. And the ABC is sort of the number that they stacked up on there. So we thought we'd throw that out there. Uh, in yeah, the uh, what is that name? Trichus phobia or something like that. The fear of the number thirteen. <laughs> yeah. But uh, of course, uh, the American Space Museum and specifically our Stay Curious program has always taken the high road in honoring our astronaut heroes. On our program, there will be a major. Memorial, as there is every year, Sunday, January 29th at a Astronaut Memorial Sandpoint Park, not our Space View Park. This is at the base of the big bridge just uh, north of our Space View Park. Astronaut Nicole Pisano Stott is going to be our honored keynote speaker. And this is a very patriotic and reverent event that we will be broadcasting uh, as a special Stay Curious program that day. So all of our Stay Curious family can watch that uh, with our fingers crossed, Marty. We've we tried this two years in a row. It's never had its moments of uh, uh, challenges, but... Uh, we think we'll get it down this year. This is also sponsored by the city of Titusville and the American Space Museum. So quite an event out there, Hugh, and we hope to see you at it this year. Well, I hope to be there. And nothing says, you know, our love for the astronauts and the Challenger and Columbia crew than the display out there at the Kennedy Visitors Complex. This is the memorial room that shows a piece of Challenger with the American flag on it on the left. And then the wind wind windscreen uh that held the cockpit windows of columbia's on the right mm -hmm. uh 20th anniversary of columbia this year hugh yeah and 37th for challenger and you know when you go see those wind uh the window screens there frames there's still pine needles in it from the louisiana dirt that they were taken from so we're going to be taking you down one day marty and i are going to do a program this month on the wonderful memorial out there so those of you that haven't had a chance to go out there can see it 
But Hugh, you have written a book on this tragedy, a, a short little book. We know you all want to buy it and try and get an autographed copy. We're going to try to get some in the building, and we'll announce that later in the month. But you can buy it today at the usual sources. Uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble has it, Books a Million, uh, a bargain at $12. Uh, there's the uh, but Challenger, an American Tragedy, and uh, basically... Uh, we're going to come back and revisit this book in a, in a, in uh, at the end of our Stay Curious program here. But Hugh, uh, sort of basically, um, why were you motivated to write this, and, and what is your story? Well, th there's been a lot written about Challenger, as you know, and most of them are pretty much nuts and bolts about here's what happened and why and that sort of thing. And I sort of felt that there needed to be at least one book that not only told the story of what happened and in sort of sort of a minute by minute uh, countdown uh, process uh, and, and get in the facts, but also mention many of the uh, the people who were involved. And uh, of course, you. I couldn't get all of the people involved uh, in the book, uh, but I put in people that I didn't think would be mentioned otherwise, uh, including uh, uh, a number from public affairs uh, who had to deal with the uh, onslaught of, um, of news media uh, that uh, came after the, uh, after the accident. And um, you, I'm sure, will remember uh, that there really weren't very many news media here. Uh, we were getting to the place where people were thinking this is very routine and uh, not very much new news. And um, as a result, uh, uh, most of the uh, uh, of the networks were not here. CNN was here. And um, I can't remember how many uh, media we had for the launch, but it was much lower than uh, a lot of the previous ones. Well, as a matter of fact, we started out with uh, like 2,000 uh, for the very early launches. And uh, I think we were down uh, to a, a couple hundred uh, for that launch. And um, naturally what happened though, as soon as the accident occurred, is that uh, w within uh, 24 hours, we had, we were back at a couple thousand uh, press uh, who had, uh, we had spent, uh, their, their companies uh, had spent a lot of money to uh, get them here quickly. And, um, their assignment was really get the news first and exclusively. And if you can imagine uh, 2,000 reporters competing with each other, that's exactly what they were doing. And uh, there was one case uh, which was later on in the investigation uh, where there was always rumors of having found uh, the remains of the astronauts, and uh, in some cases, uh, news organizations reported that they were found when they weren't. And um, there was uh, one uh, uh, reporter, um, and I won't tell you whether it was a man or a woman, uh, who was saying, you've got to tell me. Uh, I, and was crying because their editor said all these other news or outlets uh, have the story and we don't. And I had to tell them that there's no story there. We haven't found the uh, hmm. remains yet. But uh, it was a uh, a, a very we we were open 24 hours a day for uh, uh, more than a month and. Um, hmm and uh, seven days a week uh, and uh, what a nightmare a in many time. ways we're going to revisit <clears throat> specific stories of two scoops by two well-known 
uh, reporters that you dealt with at this time. We're going to talk uh, more about this, Hugh, at the, uh, so stay curious out there. But yeah, what insight in Europe, you think about that, you don't think about the money being spent in 1986. And uh, uh, did a lot of people come from Europe and... and uh, well, and eventually, Japan, yeah. They didn't get here that night or right, right, the right, next uh, day. But uh, yes, we, we, uh, we had a, a lot will, from all over the world. We will share a little more about that, about Hugh's book, uh, a, a beautiful uh, tome there. Does, some books don't have to be long to be so concise. There it is. Uh, I'll tell you what, I, I devoured it and, and just relished uh, the insight that you find from uh, a man on the scene, Mr. Hugh Harris, during that tragedy 37 years ago. Uh, but first, we're going to celebrate some of the great missions of January uh, in a chronological year order. And let Hugh take it away first with STS-51C Discovery uh, launched with this crew on January 24th, 1985. Take well, it away, Hugh. Well, th this was the 15th flight of the shuttle uh, and the 100th human being uh, who was, uh, 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 was to fly in space. Uh, but I can't tell you much about it uh, because, you can't. <laughs> because it was a Department of Defense uh, uh, launch, and it's still classified. <laughs> First so, DOD <laughs> mission, too. Yep, still and, classified. Uh, and that's uh, it was sort of a, a challenge doing the uh, commentary because we actually started commentary normally hours before the launch occurred and talked about the tanking and what was happening and and of course uh, uh, the crew going out to the uh, pad and all that sort of thing well the rules that the uh, department of defense put on it uh, and this was partly because we had uh, uh, russian trawlers which basically were spy ships hmm. uh, out uh, in the Atlantic uh, off the uh, the coast uh, is that uh, and and you can calculate uh, frequently uh, uh, the orbits and uh, what you're looking at if you know the exact uh, time of launch and then later on the uh, various milestones uh, but in any case we weren't allowed to actually say we are counting and there's uh, this many minutes left until nine minutes before the, uh, the mm. launch when everybody was used to us doing it for hours. And uh, wow. uh, so in any case... Did the, uh, all DOD missions operate like that? I believe there's 10 of them. Uh, basically, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I think there might have been... Uh, Commander Ken Mattingly there, Lauren Shriver, pilot. Uh, there to the far right is Al Onizuka, mm -hmm. who lost his life in Challenger and launched in there. Uh, Boochley and uh, Peyton are the other astronauts there uh, with what, like go-kart helmets there is what they wore <laughs> so, their, so their heads wouldn't get banged around there. Anything else about the, the Discovery and F-51C? Well, actually... Uh, despite the fact that uh, publicity was at a bare minimum at the beginning, uh, an IMAX uh, camera uh, was able to uh, film it, and uh, there are scenes from that on uh, the uh, the movie The Dream is Alive. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting, a dream, DOD Dream of Alive mission there. You, we've all seen The Dream of Alive. Dream is alive yeah, right. <laughs> uh, in there, but uh, it was basically mm -hmm. when the cargo bay was empty yes. of the uh, top secret satellite that it put out. Well, next up, mission of 10 shuttles of the month of January is 61C Columbia, launched on January 12th, 1986. That's right, 16 days before the fateful Challenger launch. I'm going backwards there. And, and I chose a crew picture of them in their street clothes, so to speak. But this has got some interesting crew members and history. Take it away. Well, well the 
Yes, this was a a very interesting crew uh, from a number of uh, aspects, uh, but probably the most interesting uh, as far as we at NASA were concerned was that two people who would become NASA administrators were on that particular mission. And Bill Nelson, who was presently the administer, mm -hmm. Top uh, administrator left back there. of... Uh, of, of NASA uh, was on it, and uh, Charlie Bolden, uh, General Charlie Bolden, who was a Marine general, uh, was also on it. Um, the uh, what a, the, the mission of um, uh, was made possible. You can see that this is a pretty good sized crew. Well, the original um, uh, shuttles. Uh, had ejection seats, uh, and uh, that was in case of uh, there there being a uh, a problem where it happened just at the right time, where they could eject out of the uh, the shuttle and uh, parachute down uh, to the ocean as one would expect. Um, but those uh, they decided that was really not a good idea and uh, they in this particular uh, launch uh, they had uh, eliminated all of the uh, ejection seats and that made for more room the ejection seats are pretty bulky and uh, the other ones while you know they're good size they're uh, they allowed for more crew to be in the uh, the, the cabin they had a hard time getting off the pad, I understand. Well, and uh, yes, and uh, one would say, uh, you know, that it was a, uh, a precursor in some ways uh, uh, to Challenger in that there were so many problems that occurred. Uh, the, uh, that particular launch, uh, 61C, was scrubbed or delayed seven times and uh, and once it came up to t minus one minute uh, on its fifth attempt and uh, was uh, sh shut down at the uh, at the uh, the last second really that and you're that commentating you that. that with with some anxiety maybe well yes <laughs> <laughs> uh, well what, what one of the problems I had uh, was in trying to figure out what was the problem, uh, because while I could listen to all of the commentary, uh -huh. it didn't. Uh, the commentary didn't necessarily explain uh, what the person was actually looking at. Mm. We knew where the, it was, but um, for Bill Nelson, and um, uh, it must have been a. Uh, uh, sort of a scary proposition, although uh, in talking to him, uh, he felt that there was an abundance of caution uh, that, uh, you know, made, uh, uh, that led to the decisions uh, not to launch in some of those cases. You know, Bill and, Nelson on his, of course, he was a, a political figure. Was yes. he senator no, or he representative? Was, he, he was a rep con yeah, congressman. congressman. Yeah. Um, and what I like about Bill is that uh, he does not consider himself an astronaut. He says I was a space tra uh, tour, or not tourist, space participant. Yes, is how he says it on there. But still, we we put him up there to the 594 humans that have orbited the Earth. Well, absolutely, he did. And, and he did. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, he also have two uh, Nelsons on there. Pinky Nelson uh, mm -hmm. did a spacewalk. Uh, quite a quite an interesting uh, group of people there. Charlie Bolden, of course, is uh, seated in his Marine uh, outfit on the left there, and Hoot Gibson is the commander in his Navy uh, outfit there, and the rest were civilians. And uh, Ch Franklin Chang Diaz there on the right, this was his first flight. He had became the most experienced uh, flyer with uh, um, uh, Jerry Ross, seven flights on the show right. there. So. Well, what one thing that um, uh, probably Bill Nelson remembers best is when he was well, he was supposed to land at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Yeah. But 
because of uh, weather and that sort of thing. Uh, he had to land in um, uh, California, and uh, he had expected that he would be welcomed back with the Florida orange being presented to him. Well, instead, the people in California uh, did it one better and gave him a peck of California oranges and grapefruit. <laughs> That's good. And I knew where you were going with that. Yes. He, he thought he'd be landing in his home state, and instead in California they gave him the citrus from California. That's there. right. That, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, the next flight, year-wise, of course, is just 12, 16 days after 61C. It'd be 51L. 61C was actually in the 1986 uh, fiscal year, but 51L was in the 1985 fiscal year and all of his paperwork. That's why this sort of confusion and uh, we have behind us here, uh, Hugh, what you say is one of the, uh, well, what's your comment about the launch? Well, I think it's one of the most beautiful launches. Uh, uh, it, well, primarily because of the birds. Absolutely. And um, it was just, you know, picture perfect. Uh, the, uh, of course, we, we know, you know, why the sky was the way it was and the, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, and there are always, uh, whenever there was a launch, there were always a lot of birds who were disturbed uh, <laughs> uh, by it. But the, uh, the, uh, the, the biggest loss, uh, as far as wildlife was concerned, uh, had to do with the fish. Really? And um, uh, you may or may not know that when you have a, uh, uh, a reasonable size uh, body of water, such as we had around the pads, that we drained the uh, the water that was used to uh, dampen the sound, uh, spray it onto the uh, launch platform. Uh, it had to go somewhere, and what it did was it made little lakes. And um, within weeks after you create something like that, fish start to appear mm. and um, I'm uh, I'm not sure exactly how they get there uh, I assume it has something to do with birds yeah <laughs> but it is what happens is are you on line there Marty yeah yeah the birds get uh, fish eggs on their legs ah. and then they bring that into the new lake mm -hmm. and that populates the lake of fish well and, and anyway every time uh, we had a launch and we started dumping scalding water in there. Uh, it killed the fish that were there. Oh wow! And uh, uh, that water would be hot and yes. scalding. And um, the but within a couple of weeks after that, the fish would start appearing again. And I'm glad Marty was here to. What a stay uh, curious uh, fact for all you out there. That's yeah. right. The the legs of the birds bringing fish eggs to the. Uh, retention ponds around for the water suppression system there. Uh, you're only hearing it here from the one and only Mr. Hugh Harris. We're so happy you're with us, Hugh. Uh, on uh, the next uh, launch uh, of the month of January, being 1990, STS-32, uh, we've got the uh, the, the main, uh, we're going to revisit Columbia here, or Challenger here at the end. But uh, what are we looking at there on STS-32? Well, that again was another uh, Department of Defense mission, and uh, but once it launched or did whatever it was supposed to for the Department of Defense, uh, it um, was used to recover uh, the long duration exposure facility. Now that long duration faci uh, facility uh, was testing. Uh, all sorts of things uh, in the vacuum of space and the environment, because there's there's a lot of um, things, including radiation, uh, that you find uh, in space. And this was uh, looking at what is the effect uh, that all of that has on various types of services, uh, surfaces, and uh, also. Uh, on electronic um, panels and that sort of thing. 
And um, it was only supposed to be up there for a fairly short time, a matter of months. But by the time we had that launch, because of the delay with uh, the Challenger accident, um, it was f up there for four and a half years. Mm. And um, at the time, uh, that particular launch, uh, uh, SDS-32, uh, took uh, was up for a record time at that moment uh, for 11 days. Now that's you know not nearly as many uh, as some of the later flights, but it was a uh, it was a, a good long time at that time. Absolutely, over a week. Because and... we were still studying, and you'll see as we go through some of these, uh, looking at what are the effects of space flight on people, and uh, what are the you know the good things and the bad. And um, once again, IMAX uh, uh, was uh, shooting uh, a film uh, both at the launch and on board. And uh, that uh, film was used again in the uh, movie, The Blue Planet. Ooh, we've seen that one. You notice the, uh, how the LDEF, uh, Long Duration Exposure Facility, uh, has got some, something on the left is, has folded up. Uh, being out there four and a half years, Hugh, may have benefited the the construction of the International Space Station by showing them some of the paints and polymers and metals. Well, that's right. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're kind of a silver lining to that on there. Uh, well, the next shuttle we have up is uh, this crew, STS-42. Uh, 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 42, there you go. International Microgravity Lab. Now, what, once again, uh, with that, uh, we were really studying the effects of uh, space flight and the space environment on various things, ranging from living organisms uh, to electronics and various other things. And um, uh, because of the uh, that particular lab uh, had to work 24 hours a day, Actually, they had a lot more days. Yeah, uh, but <laughs> and their days were a lot shorter. days a day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, but uh, uh, they had to have a, a red and blue team uh, so that half of the astronauts were awake during uh, half of the of the uh, the time, and the another team uh, then took their place uh, for the. Uh, for the next uh, 12 hours. Great. Well, we're talking with Mr. Hugh Harris, the former voice of NASA, who spent 35 years in the public affairs office, uh, either in uh, the, uh, up in Cleveland area or around the uh, Cape uh, Kennedy here. Well, both. Yes. Both, yeah, both. Mm -hmm. uh, indeed, started up in Cleveland, you've told us. Um, 10 shuttles of the month of January. We're halfway through them. And uh, we're going through them uh, chronologically, year by year. The, uh, the and you know they all represent kind of uh, the month represents a little bit of everything that the shuttle did. Hugh, the Department mm -hmm. of Defense missions. We're going to see the Mir space station docking so integral, uh, taking satellites for pay up to space, uh, and and breaking into the laboratory uh, uh, business that is now was the bedrock for what's going on the International Space Station. And the next shuttle has a very important mission that uh, had to be flown on five or six shuttle flights. ST and you'll tell us about that with STS-54 and the object we're looking at here, Hugh. Well, the, that, that's actually the, uh, uh, the launch of a TDRS satellite, I believe. Tracking data and relay station. Right. And um, this really uh, helps illustrate why the uh, shuttle was originally conceived and built. And that was uh, to have a reusable spacecraft uh, that was capable of many, many tasks. One of them was launching satellites, uh, which you can do on uh, you know, much smaller rockets. 
but also uh, allowing people to start living in space. Um, and uh, that that's something uh, that was very, uh, you know, was a, a big unknown uh, at the time that the uh, space program was started. And, uh, and that was uh, one reason, uh, as well as safety, uh, that the Russians, for instance, uh, launched a dog to start with, you know, could the dog survive? Um, unfortunately, they didn't bring that dog back, but, the, uh, uh, but we launched uh, uh, chimpanzees, uh, which were sort of a closer analog to people and uh, uh, tested them uh, sort of endlessly to see what was the effect of being in space on them. And we did bring them back and uh, uh, they ended up, uh, after they got over being mad in some cases, uh, <laughs> with uh, uh, living their lives out in, uh, in, in pretty nice comfort. Yes. Uh, but, uh, Ham retired in the National Zoo, I believe, in there. <laughs> yes. But uh, uh, in any case, the uh, uh, one of the things that was practiced on STS-54 was how do you actually turn bolts and uh, put together uh, various structures, uh, and how do you run... Uh, uh, electrical lines and uh, optical cables and that sort of thing uh, in zero gravity. And as we go through the rest of these, there's uh, a number of, of shuttles that actually uh, were doing uh, pretty much the same thing. The tracking data relay <clears throat> station shown here is still active. Uh, there's, uh, I think there's six of them in certain orbits mm -hmm. around the Earth. This is how the ISS Astronauts communicate with Houston and all of our military. Uh, some of them go through uh, this. Of course, they've got other military satellites to do their top secret stuff. So very important uh, mission to get the, these babies up there. We actually lost the tracking data relay station in the Challenger disaster. But the, you know, the one of the basic reasons for that was that in order to gather the information, and to control the uh, the shuttle, uh, we had to have tracking stations on ground around the world. Uh, but when, once you got the uh, uh, these satellites up there, then you no longer needed uh, to have nearly as many. Uh, uh, really, they were more the the Earth-based ones were more backup uh, mm -hmm. than uh, they had been originally, which was absolutely essential yeah. called tedris very important uh tedris right there very important to our our uh, space program and national security well moving along a shuttle that was launched january 11th 1996 there's the crew of course it includes our great friend there mr winston scott you're no stranger with winston and and, and his great deeds he's done in our community uh, well and also his uh, he's a great musician as well. Absolutely, trumpet player. That's what he went to scholarship for at, uh, at, at the floor as a Florida Seminole. Uh, you're going to tell us an interesting fact about this mission. Uh, Want to point out Dan Barry at the lower left there with the huge smile, mm -hmm. and above him is uh, uh, Koichi Wakata. Uh, he's on the space station as we speak right now. Koichi is on his third mission. You're going to talk about that. Tell us a little more about this mission of STS-72 and Spaceship Endeavor, Hugh Harris. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. <laughs> the, uh, of course, that was a uh, really a, a, a Japanese mission in, in many ways. Um, the, uh, the Japanese had orbited a uh, free flyer, uh, a spacecraft, and uh, Endeavor was going to recover that. And um, the, uh, the only problem that they ran into, which had been foreseen, uh, was that when they got it on board, 
uh, the uh, instruments were saying that the solar panels on the uh, uh, on the free flyer uh, were not latching properly, and uh, so it, uh, it they had been designed so they could be jettisoned because they no longer were needed, of course, because the uh, spacecraft was being brought back, and it was being brought back inside of a of a shuttle where it wasn't going to get any sun anyway mm -hmm. on those solar panels. So those were uh, jettisoned into space and burned up um, as they re-entered the atmosphere. But um, one of the things that uh, I think was very interesting, I don't know how many uh, people out there uh, are familiar with the Japanese uh, game of Go. And I, I know that you know a little bit about that. And I played it. Um, there it is uh, at the, the board of the, is it China, Japanese? Japanese. Go. Yes. All right. And they, um, I uh, used to uh, uh, play it uh, very, very briefly for a, a few months. And I don't remember now <laughs> what the uh, object uh, entirely is for winning it. And um, however, uh, one of the uh, the famous makers of uh, uh, the Go board and uh, the uh, of the of the game uh, put together a space Go uh, game. And uh, Koichi Wakata and uh, uh, Dan Barry uh, were the ones who played, and um, at the uh, so they played they, this game in the on on the uh, space shuttle yes. Endeavor during the now, flight. Now I don't know whether they used magnets or what to make sure that all of the little pieces didn't fly around, but in any case. Uh, it had been designed so it could be used in space, and um, the uh, both uh, Mr. Wakata and uh, uh, Dan Barry were awarded the uh, Ni Don Award, if I'm pronouncing it right, mm -hmm. which is sort of the uh, the Oscar of Go game players. That's interesting. Uh, and uh, he was the first Westerner. Uh, to ever uh, uh, to ever make that uh, particular oh. award, the the other thing that is curious, uh, uh, but it probably only because it uh, sounds funny to me, uh, is that all of us are Westerners to somebody. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and that the, is, and <laughs> the Japanese are Westerners to China. Yeah, for right. That's, so anyway, that's but, it. Yeah, good. Dan Barry there, the guy with the big smile, just above Hugh there, and and Wakata above him there. Uh, boy, I hope they uh, Wakato. I might see at a hotel when they launch a Japanese astronaut in November when mm. he comes back. I'm going to ask about that. But Dan Barry, some of you know that love the program Survivor. He was on the program Survivor. Uh, Marty watches that, and he was uh, he made it pretty far in the thing. He was voted off like the fifth or sixth one left there. But uh, just interesting guy. Uh, we'd love to meet him there. Uh, and uh, so we're. Let's keep going here with our shuttles of the month there. And, and next up, after an STS-72 uh, there in 1996, is, uh, and the game of Go being played up there, is, 19, is STS-81, launched January 12, 1997. Well, that was uh, another of the, uh, it was the fifth of uh, nine missions uh, that were, uh, to this wild-looking structure there. To go to the Mir spacecraft, the uh, the Russian Mir. And um, the uh, uh, John Blaha uh, had been up there on the, uh, went up there on the fourth mission to the uh, Mir and uh, had been there for uh, several months. And uh, he was uh, replaced uh, with Jerry Leninger, um, and um, the uh, 
so most of most of their uh, trip was involved with bringing up supplies to the uh, to the mirror as well as the uh, change of uh, personnel but one of the um, uh, science experiments that they brought back involved uh, growing uh, crops in space and growing crops in space is essential to when you start going a lot farther than the moon uh, because carrying along seeds to build to grow things is a lot lighter than actually taking the uh, the product itself mm -hmm. in in that particular case uh, they brought back um, wheat uh, seeds that had been grown uh, from uh, seed in space to the time that they produced seeds and then those seeds were brought back and uh, of course what they were looking for was what was the effect that that had on the uh, uh, well on the both germination and the uh, uh, you know were there any sort of biological changes uh, in the uh, in the seeds that were grown in space uh, rather than the ones that are grown on Earth, and did that affect the nutrition at all? Mm -hmm. So that was a pretty interesting um, uh, experiment, and uh, we um, uh, we really need to keep sight of what we're learning uh, that seems to be a little mundane, but is really going to pay big dividends uh, if we go to Mars or further out. Absolutely. Got to take food with us and water. And we figured out the water problem by drinking our own urine, but which every astronaut says it, it's actually more purified than regular water. Uh, well, the next shuttle of the month of January was Endeavour on STS-89 in 1998. Uh, again, uh, there's the patch, mission patch there, and again to the mirror. And and I think it's particularly valuable uh, to have been cooperating with the uh, Russian space program, as well as all of the space programs of the other countries in the world. We mentioned Japan, but there there is about... Uh, uh, there's more than a dozen countries, uh, and uh, if you only consider the uh, uh, the European Space Agency, that's that's probably probably a dozen just by itself. Mm -hmm. uh, but the uh, this is really a uh, investigation uh, or a discovery uh, that's necessary for all of humanity and um, the uh, and of course the uh, the things that come out of it uh, actually get into people's uh, lives fairly quickly uh, but it's really going to shape uh, the future of humankind and um, I was trying to remember the name of the uh, of the uh, of the writer uh, who said that when humans are on another planet and then another one, there is no way that they will be exterminated in the universe. Absolutely. We must reach out and get off planet Earth for various reasons to uh, keep humanity alive, basically. Great thoughts there, Hugh. Again, the patch of STS-89, uh, there's eight astronauts on that patch, only because uh, they took uh, Andy Thomas up to replace David Wolf. And this was the last exchange in 1998. We started building our, our space station with cooperation of Russia. And like Hugh said, though adversaries on earth everybody is friends and and partners mm -hmm. in space right well we're we're all humans that's and, right and i think we should be 
friends with each other because that's how we got to where we are now. And it's the only way we're going to get to the future. Well said. And the last shuttle launch chronologically in the month of January was STS-107, Columbia, on January 16th, 2003. Of course, it it uh, met its demise February 1st after a very successful two-week mission. We're showing here. Uh, Hugh, what are we looking at here? And you've got a special little story to go with this that nobody's ever heard before, I guarantee it. Take it away, Hugh. <laughs> That's that's our space lab there. Of uh, that space hab of one oh seven. Well, the uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure what you were uh, really referring. Well, to. Well, just the... what I'm uh, just leading you into the space <clears throat> hab is shown out the uh, shuttle yeah. back window there. Astronauts yeah. are in there doing science, and then you've got a, a wonderful little sidebar story here. Well, the about uh, a German concentration camp. In well, there. yes, and that was, of course, a very small uh, part of this. Uh, but this particular mission, uh, SDS-107, was one of the sort of chock-full uh, science missions uh, that was flown. And um, there were hundreds of experiments. And... Um, it was uh, very successful uh, with uh, a, a lot of information uh, uh, being developed in various areas, including the medical area. And um, the because of so much of the data was being uh, beamed back down uh, uh, to the Earth, um, when the... Uh, uh, accident occurred coming back, uh, it ended up that 40% of all the data that had been gathered uh, was preserved. Uh, now, 30% of that uh, was preserved through the, uh, the downlinks. 10% actually uh, was uh, found during the search. There were uh, once the uh, the accident occurred, uh, there was uh, hundreds and possibly a, a thousand or more people uh, who were uh, going everywhere uh, that they could uh, possibly guess that pieces of the shuttle had uh, fallen to Earth. Now, the, uh, we probably ought to mention first uh, that what had caused the uh, uh, the tragedy was the uh, during the launch uh, a piece of the uh, the foam had come off of the uh, external tank and had impacted the uh, wing of the orbiter and uh, had uh, actually damaged a uh, carbon carbon uh, fiber panel uh, that was there, uh, which when uh, the uh, re-entry occurred, uh, you get tremendous heat uh, into thousands of degrees, uh, and that got into the wing um, and uh, uh, caused the uh, entire uh, shuttle to uh, uh, come apart. But the... Um, you referred to the um, one of the interesting things on board. Uh, the uh, NASA and the astronauts uh, sometimes take things up that you would not expect, uh, uh, but uh, really has relevance to a particular segment of the uh, of the population and of uh, of industry. In this particular case, um, a, uh, a drawing, uh, well, a, a painting uh, was taken that uh, was uh, produced by a, a man named uh, Peter Gins, uh, who during the time uh, he was 14 years old 
and the uh, inmate of a German concentration camp uh, during World War II. And um, it depicted what he imagined the Earth looked like uh, from the moon. And I think you have that picture there. there. Um, and um, hmm. it's... Uh, it's from nineteen mid nineteen forties, a fourteen year old artist in yes. concentration camp. <clears throat> There's the Earth from the Moon. Wow. And that unfortunately was one of the things that was lost. Uh, the uh, however, there is good news. Mm -hmm. uh, the... Interesting <laughs> anecdote, though, Hugh. Like you said, yes. who would have thought that that was carried aboard? Uh, you know, uh, with some astronaut or or you know. Uh, well, very, I, very I think it, it it could have been part of the NASA art program. The NASA program, art program, yeah. But I'm you know I'm not uh, sure because very I, interesting there. Uh, however, the uh, <clears throat> one of the things that was uh, recovered uh, was an experiment that uh, was studying cancer treatments, and uh, it also. Uh, uh, help test theories about microorganisms uh, surfing long trips through outer space on meteorites uh, and asteroids. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, and of course, that is one of the possibilities of how life got here to Earth. Uh, yeah. And um, I'm circling that to follow up on that testing theories about microorganisms surfing on asteroids and comets and so forth. However, hmm. the uh, uh, you know I think the more dominant theory uh, has to do uh, with the fact that uh, 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 solar uh, uh, dust uh, from uh, the explosion of stars hmm. uh, is actually um, w what um, has had a big effect on the creation of, of life here on Earth and our bodies, that we are made of uh, of uh, space stuff. Star stuff. Star yeah. stuff. Yeah, everybody knows and, I'm uh, made of star stuff. Hugh, thank you very much, Hugh. There's our shuttle, 10 shuttles of the month. We're going to reprise your book now uh, for all of you out there. Please stay tuned a little longer. As Hugh's got some really interesting things to share about your little, your, where would we put your little book there? Here it is. Let me put the meme, the picture up there for it. There it is. Challenger, an American Tragedy, the inside story from Launch Control uh, by Mr. Hugh Harris. Uh, like you said, you can get this at the usual places. Uh, you wrote this in 2014, eight years ago. Uh, you explained earlier about the need uh, to do this from the inside perspective. But Hugh, we're going to talk about two scoops that you talk about in there. One from your great friend and another one from a great reporter. Well, they're they're both great reporters. Yeah, yeah, they are. <laughs> and, they are. Yeah, but the, you personally knew one and, better than the other. And, and the, uh, well, I, I knew both of them very well. And I, I really like both of them. Well, tell us about <laughs> the, it. Uh, well, in the, uh, in the case of Challenger, um, uh, one of the uh, reporters uh, for, uh, uh, for NBC, uh, Jay Barbary, uh, was probably had uh, some of the, the best sources uh, in the space community. He had been here uh, since the beginning of the uh, space program and knew many of the workers. And, um, and he also uh, was a, a very uh, honest and um, ethical reporter. He wasn't just out uh, to find something uh, that would be uh, exciting or uh, you know, surprising uh, to people or to be, uh, you know, un uncovering uh, a, a perceived uh, uh, flaw in whatever he was looking at. But um, he, his work dated back to the, uh, pretty much the, uh, the very beginning of the, uh, of the space program. And um, 
the one of the uh, uh, friends of the museum, uh, as a matter of fact, was a, uh, a good friend of his. And um, the, uh, it just happened uh, that that friend had uh, retired uh, just uh, a month or so before uh, the uh, Challenger accident. And, um, and you know that I'm talking about Sam Benningfield. Okay. And uh, uh, Jay uh, immediately called Sam and said, Sam, you know, don't you think that you would like to uh, go out and talk to some of your friends out there at the center and see if you could, uh, uh, you know, either help them or find out uh, what the thinking was about uh, what had caused uh, the breakup of the uh, of the Challenger. And said, Sam said, well, I still have a badge and uh, I think I would like to go talk to him. And um, Jay said, uh, what's more, we're going to hire you as a consultant for NBC. Hmm. Uh, but he didn't say that until after actually Sam had gone out. In any case, uh, Sam... Uh, Bettingfield. Did, yeah, yeah did, did talk about, uh, uh, to people and, um, and learned uh, as we actually were going to uh, uh, talk about in a press conference uh, in the future, uh, the... Uh, uh, what was seen as possibly uh, the cause of the uh, the breakup of the uh, shuttle. And um, as you mentioned earlier, um, you know, we all, all of us uh, at some point, uh, but some more than others, talk about the explosion that, uh, that uh, destroyed it. Actually, it wasn't... A, an explosion. Um, uh, the The problem had to do with a, uh, a burn through of the uh, O rings, which are like big washers on the solid rocket motor, uh, and um, which allowed um, uh, and it had and there was actually two of them: a uh, primary one and a uh, secondary one, and um, on a number of uh, earlier shuttles, including the very the second one that was launched, um, that O-ring uh, had been uh, uh, damaged, uh, but the secondary O-ring uh, contained the uh, hot gases, and so there was uh, uh, no uh, problem that occurred, and that happened a number of times. And uh, people be, I, my own opinion is that, you know, people became complacent. And while that was a subject of how do we redesign it, it wasn't given the priority that it might have had. But in this particular case on Challenger, uh, the, uh, the hot gases uh, uh, and, and flames basically uh, had breached both O-rings and had shot out the side of the uh, solid rocket booster at the uh, the brackets that held the solid motor uh, to the external tank, uh, which had the hydrogen and oxygen into it. And um, when it hit the, uh, the brackets that was holding it at the bottom, it pivoted uh, over and crush the top of the uh, of the external tank, and that caused the escape of the uh, oxygen and hydrogen, and a uh, immediate uh, huge uh, uh, flame that really engulfed uh, the mm -hmm. entire thing. Um, anyway, uh, uh, Jay, uh, uh, in talking to Sam found that that was a, um, uh, the probable cause and, uh, the, uh, and uh, 
the only uh, problem that Sam had was that his um, uh, son uh, was a reporter <laughs> also, mm -hmm. and he said that he had to give that story uh, to the son. And um, Jay said, yes, but only uh, the, the, uh, the paper can use it after I reported on NBC News uh, that night, and they still have time to uh, hmm. uh, put it in the paper. So Sam agreed to that. And um, so Jay was the, had the sort of the scoop of that year hmm. uh, in uh, reporting on what had been the, uh, the problem hmm. uh, with the, uh, that caused the, uh, the oh, yeah. Your friend yeah. Jay passed away <clears throat> two years ago? Yes. About in there, and uh, Sam Bedingfield's passed away about uh, twelve years ago. He was the one of the founding uh, founders of our museum. You know, right? His NASA badge was number four. <laughs> and he was yeah. one of the first twenty hired, and they did it alphabetically. Yeah. So B, he was like NASA badge number four. A great guy, known to give tours. A great friend of yours. Mm -hmm. He was sort of your go-to for dignitary tours and stuff. Like oh, that. absolutely. Well, let's it, talk about the second scoop here. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. About the the, the well, finding out what happened with the big <clears throat> news breakthrough, but then it took him a while to find the crew cabin. In fact, until the first week of March, and you've got a story in your book about one of our great reporters uh, getting a scoop on that. Well, the yes, the, the thing that was, of course, obvious uh, to all the reporters is what, you know, happened to the crew. And um, Bill Harwood, uh, who worked for CBS now for many, many years, and I, I think that at that particular point, he might have still worked for uh, United yeah. uh, Press International. And... Um, Bill, Bill is a, uh, you know, a, a brilliant reporter and has always uh, done a very fine work uh, and, uh, and uh, has been uh, very honest and um, uh, in, in what he, in researching uh, what he did uh, or what he reported on. But one of the things that he did uh, up at the press site was that he set up an antenna system which allowed him to listen to the uh, tracking um, uh, ships that were out looking for the uh, crew cabin uh, of Challenger. And um, the, uh, I, I don't, but he also had, uh, uh, many friends who uh, were workers out here, though I'm not absolutely sure where the uh, uh, the final information came from, but I happen to have been uh, the only one <laughs> working at the uh, the press site at the at the time this happened, and he uh, uh, came running in and and said, uh, you know do you know this? And um, no, I didn't know it, uh, that uh, they had found the uh, remains of the astronauts. And I said, uh, well, let, let me uh, check uh, uh, to uh, make sure that that's actually happened because there are all sorts of rumors for weeks about that. And, um, but I said, you know, it's your story, and uh, the I certainly will not release it uh, until you've had a chance to uh, uh, get the uh, the story to, to your sources. Uh, but ten minutes after that happens, <laughs> then I'll release it. And uh, that's sort of the way it went. We uh, uh, in, in the uh, the case of Jay. Uh, the I forgot to mention that um, he was also looking for a second source uh, when he talked to me about the uh, 
the cause of the accident. And just by chance, uh, he was leaving the, uh, the dome that we used for the uh, offices of, at the press site and ran into uh, our center director who was coming uh, uh, from the uh, place where we did the uh, uh, press uh, conferences. And uh, he said, do you know that th this is the uh, what I'm hearing about the uh, uh, the cause of the accident. And the center director at that time, Dick Smith, says, you've got it. And of course, uh, Jay then had a second source that was, you know, very official hmm. uh, for his story. Uh, in this case, uh, I had to uh, uh, check to make sure that the uh, crew cabin had indeed been found. Uh, but certainly was not going to uh, uh, step on Bill's having the first chance to uh, get that story out uh, because he had used his uh, smarts and ingenuity to uh, to get the uh, the facts first. Bill Harwood, we'd love to have you stay curious with us one day. I, 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 oh, me he, being a he, journalist, I admire his work greatly. Yeah, since he works for CBS, I don't know whether... He's allowed to do podcasts, yeah, but he um, would be terrific on this. Yeah, he's, he's my source of, of space news and many of us out there. Uh, two scoops in the book here that, uh, uh, that he wrote. A, that, two that we lost. There, there we go. We got, got a little microphone glitch there. There is it back there, Marty. I touched it there and and everything goes to hell. Uh, we're glad that Tony Achilles is watching. Uh, Achilles, Tony, thank you for the scoop that Walt Cunningham died. Uh, he told us that about a half hour before we went live, and Ooh. and uh, I shared it on Facebook. Thank you, Tony, for that. Uh, Danny Noah is watching. Uh, Neil 1030 is watching. Ophelia Sauterill, she is in Normandy, France. Mm. And why don't you give a shout out? I'll, I'll say hi to Maurice. I'm gonna get her name right. Uh, Kwasinski, all right, and John Barali, Cliff Watson, my buddy in Australia. How's everything in Thursday morning over there in uh, Pomona, Australia, Cliff? And he's giving us 200 stars just like you can. That's two bucks. And Tom <laughs> Celentano, and say hello to our rest of our group. I went to Tom. Go. You know, well, uh, Steve Hammer and... Uh, Tammy McGoogle uh, Miller, or not sure I can read your writing here. <laughs> the, um, uh, Dave Strange. Dave Stangy, yeah. William. Oh, Dave Stangy, sorry. Yeah. And yes. William Whiting, hey, Bill. Yeah. And Daniel DeJong and Tom Usiak, who we. No, and Carlton Bailey, a great another great photographer, and Mark Uziak. Yes, and Dave uh, uh, Marty, our good friend uh, Daniel DeYoung, a, a, a pilot. Uh, I hope you weren't hung up in that uh, mess this morning there, Daniel, that we all mm. saw in the news where uh, everything was grounded till nine in the morning. Uh, we'll talk about that next time you come into our museum here. It's fun to have friends like this regularly watch yeah, and stay curious. We know there's dozens of you out there that don't uh, put your name up there, and that's fine with us. Just tell your friends to uh, watch us, like us, share us, subscribe to us on YouTube and Facebook on there. Uh, what a wonderful show with the one and only Mr. Hugh Harris. Thank you, sir, for your great insight into the shuttles of of January, particularly uh, of your book. Uh, I know we'll be selling some more copies of that. We're, well, I'll let you know when we get our shipment in the museum here. Maybe we can get an autographed copy out to you. Uh, want to mention that uh, our heroes are honored all over our great country, and this is the uh, Challenger Memorial at the uh, Washington, D.C., Arlington National Cemetery mm -hmm. out there. And we'll be talking more about them in a positive light throughout the month. And we hope that you can make plans to join us either through a State Curious Press or broadcast 
or in person as we celebrate the Apollo 1 Challenger and Columbia astronauts Sunday, January 29th at 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time uh, at a park uh, at the foot of the big bridge here in Titusville. Keynote speaker is our friend Earthling Nicole Pisano Stott, and she will have a poignant message to deliver about her friends on the 20th anniversary of the Columbia tragedy. And that makes the hair crawl up the back of my <laughs> neck just thinking about uh, about that, Hugh. So uh, anyway, Marty, uh, thank you for a great Streamlabs job here. Thank you all for staying with the wonderful Hugh Harris. Uh, on uh, and uh, we're going to let Hugh always talk as long as he wants to, buddy. Appreciate you being here and supporting our museum. Any final thoughts, sir? Well, not really, other than, you know, I really, the only people that called me the voice of NASA were news media. That wasn't my title. <laughs> well, you're the public information officer, right? Well, yes. PAO. Well, I was director of public affairs. Director but... of public affairs there. Uh, but uh, well, we love you as the voice of NASA and whatever you want to hook yourself into. <laughs> you're a valuable uh, supporter and friend of our American Space Museum. And I appreciate you so much uh, getting us uh, your your whole... Uh, Hugh has got a lot of his friends now involved in, in our museum, and we are very grateful for that. So, Marty, again, great Streamlabs job. Mr. Harris, we'll see you back in for the shuttles of February, if not before. Until then, I'm Mark Marquez saying we can't wait to see you in our museum or again visiting Stay Curious to bridge the space between us. <laughs>